we have been going through a set of studies on, 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 on popular doctrines in Christendom, which I believe are contrary to what the Bible teaches. And not just contrary to what the Bible teaches, but which I believe are either clearly very harmful or potentially can be harmful. And I've been, we have not been following any particular sequence in how we look at these topics. We have looked at the doctrine of hell, the doctrine of Trinity, two of which I believe to be among the most prominent false teachings. We have looked at this, the idea of the secret rapture and a few other things. And this afternoon I want to touch on something else that, you know, some people may not consider to be really much of an issue. But I, I, I think it can be potentially harmful because it's based on building on the wrong principles. If you have looked at the, the topic of our presentation this afternoon, we're looking at the Sacred Names movement. And, um, you know, the, we have touched on this, on this channel more than once before. But if I'm looking at popular false teachings. I think I, I, I don't want to leave this out. At the very beginning, you will notice that I, I have labeled it the Sacred Names Movement. I'm really, I'm really focusing on the, the idea, the idea that has, that has formed itself into a movement where people believe that it is a necessity it's a, it's a Christian duty. It's a duty of a follower of Jehovah, of Yahweh, whatever name people think should be used. It's a duty that you should use those names and that to use any other, any other form of reference to, to God or of addressing God is, is a sin. This is what I'm focusing on this afternoon. Um, the, there are different ideas, different ways that people relate to this topic. I mean, there are some people who, just simply because they prefer to do so, they like to use the names that, are, that, that were used during the time of the Hebrews. And for those people who want to do this as a matter of personal preference, I really can't see any reason why I should find why I should find fault with those people, why I should have a problem with what they are doing. And I don't. You know, it's simply a matter of personal preference. And I'm not really focusing on those kinds of believers this afternoon. I'm really focusing on those people who insist that it is necessary to use those Hebrew names. And these are usually the people who will tell you that the word God is a pagan word. They will even try to identify it with some supposed pagan God that had the name God. And they try to say that the name Jesus is a, is a pagan word. It came from the Greek God Zeus. And it has become distorted in, in, in English till it comes to Jesus. Those people will go on to tell you that Amen is a wrong word to use because Amen, they equate it to the, the, the name of the Egyptian god Amon-Ra. And, and they, they, they will get into identifying many of the words that we use with pagan gods or pagan symbols simply because the sound is similar. And um, these, are, the, 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 these are people who usually, many, many of them are into feast keeping and they are into several other forms of attachment to the Old Testament system of worship. Those are the people that I really want to, th that's the movement that I want to comment on this evening because I believe that it is it is a harmful 
it's a harmful thing. I believe that it's not just simply a matter of people saying, you know, it's nice if we do this. They are saying you have to. And when a person says you have to do something, what they are doing, they are making it a, a requirement for salvation, a, a requirement for God's approval. And this makes it, if it is false, it makes it positively dangerous. You know that I believe that in order to come to God and to be accepted, we must come through Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus is the only means of linking the human race to God. He's the only mediator between God and man. I believe this. And if this is not true, then it's a dangerous false doctrine because it is, it is closing off all angles of getting to God except one. But I believe it to be true. And it is what I build my faith on. So, what you believe, it affects how you view salvation. If you believe that it's necessary to, to, to use a certain word when you're addressing God, if you believe it's necessary to, to observe feast days, if you think any of these things are necessary for you to be accepted by God, what you have done, you have, you are really attacking the basis of salvation. And that is why your belief cannot be harmless. It cannot be something that we can just bypass. All of us are aware of what Paul says in Galatians chapter 5. Paul says that if you are circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. That, that is the principle on which I am basing my comments. Circumcision, I mean, what is, what is so bad about circumcision? And, and as we have pointed out time and time again, Paul took Timothy and circumcised him. That's exactly the, the, the principle I'm trying to focus on. When you do something and you don't think it is necessary for salvation, but you just do it because of some, some other reason, it can be a harmless thing. If you do it just because somebody says you should do it and you say, okay, I don't have any problem in doing that, you know, just to please you. You know, like, like if my wife wants me to comb my hair a certain way or if she wants me to change my glasses because she doesn't like the shape of it. No problem. I'll do that to, just to make her happy. But if she tells me I need to do it in order to be saved, then absolutely I will not conform. I will not do it. Because I'm catering to an idea that is obstructive to the gospel. And that's the point I'm trying to make. So, this is why I'm actually looking at this topic this afternoon. If we're looking at false teachings and teachings that can be harmful in the Christian pathway, I think I need to identify this. Because there are people who will be maybe watching this video who embrace the idea that, that using these sacred names are, are necessary. And I need, to, I, need to explain, I need to explain why I believe that this is a false idea. This is a harmful, false idea. Now, first of all, I'd like to point out something. Um, the, 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 a name... A name has really two aspects to it. A name has two aspects. We should remember that. There are, two, there are two purposes in a name or two aspects to a name. Let me say aspects. A name is really a, a means of identification. Okay, But it, it identifies a person in two different ways. It has the potential to identify you in two different ways. First of all, there is the, the meaning behind a name. For example, my name is David. And the, the word David is taken from a Hebrew word that literally means beloved. So maybe, maybe if somebody gave me the name David, thinking of my character, what they would want to say is that I'm a beloved person. Now this kind of this kind of usage of a name was very prominent in the Bible. So, so sometimes when a person's 
character or, or something about his identity changed, the name would change. For example, Jacob was given the name Supplanter when he was born. He was named Jacob. And the word Jacob means a supplanter because he, he stretched out his hand out of his mother's womb and grabbed onto his brother's heel. And the people saw it as a sign that he would take what belonged to his brother. And so they called him Jacob the supplanter. Many years later when Jacob wrestled with, with, with the Lord and, and he obtained power with God from that night long wrestling with God. God changed his name from Jacob, which means a supplanter, and he named him Israel, which means the Prince of God. This morning I was listening to the reading of the Bible by Alexander Scorby, and I was reading the, listening to the book of Genesis where God said to Abraham, Your name shall no longer be called Abram, but you shall be called Abraham because you have become, you will be a father of many nations. Likewise, when Jesus was born, or when he was, when he was, yeah, when he was born, or when he was conceived, the angel said to Mary, you will, cause his you will call his name Jesus, because. So what I'm saying is that you can see that one primary purpose of a name is to identify a person's character. Now I'm going to show you how this idea is illustrated, but it is taken to uh, the height of, of, of folly in today's world. For example, I don't know if you have ever heard, you have ever heard the word thebis, T-H-E-Y-B-I-E-S. Possibly most of us might have heard the word because it's one of those lunatic developments that is taking place in the world today where people... They come to the conclusion that their babies or their children, their newly born children, do not have a gender. They are neither male nor female. And so to emphasize this, they don't call them he or she. They don't call them baby, they call them babies. And, and, and they, 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 they produce all of these perverted misuses of the, of the language. And, and so, for example, you know, <clears throat> a bearded, a bearded person, six foot six, massive muscles, may choose to refer to himself uh, as she, and may insist on being called she, and may be greatly offended if you refer to such a person as he. In other words, you, you give the person, a, a, in this case, a, a, a pronoun, you refer to the person by a title or by a name that is completely contrary to the description or the character of the person. A bearded hulking man comes and says he's a lady. He's to be referred to as Miss. He might even give himself the name Beatrice. It kind of illustrates the, what I'm trying to say, that the, the, the purpose of names originally was to identify characteristics about a person. But in this crazy, lunatic world in which we live, all of that has been turned upside down. So, even, even the, 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 what do you call them? Pronouns and the, um, the identifying labels, not just personal names, but identifying labels like Miss, Mr., Boy, Girl, man, woman, these identifying labels have been perverted to the point where they, 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 they are becoming absolutely meaningless. You say somebody is a girl when he's very clearly a boy or vice versa. So that's a part of the lunacy that is taking place in today's world. But it, it, it's related to what I'm trying to say, which is that the primary purpose of words and labels was to identify characteristics. That's the first meaning of a name. And because these, these labels or these characteristics came to be associated with a certain person, the sound or the word itself came to be attached to the person. For example, if I hear somebody say, David, I'm going to turn around and look. It was kind of a little... A little 
confusing in our congregation a few years ago because there were there were three of us in the congregation who were named David. And so when somebody said David, three of us would turn to look. Because it was it was a sound. It was a sound that was applied to different persons. And when anybody heard the sound, then of course all of us would look. In, in, in the case of, of maybe the modern world, it's not so much that we are given names to identify characteristics. Most of the time, personal names are just given because they sound nice. Or they, they, they are pleasing to the ear of the person who gave the name. So in Jamaica, for example, you know, there are some... I mean, Jamaica is a country that is a mix of different cultures. But one of the things they do is that a lot of Jamaican parents now, they are giving their children African-sounding names or just names that, that are... Uh, some of those names I've never heard in my life. They just um, are pleasing to the ears of the, the parents. And so they give the children these names. So, names in the world today have become, to a great extent, simply a way of making a sound that can identify a person. So, all of this I'm saying because I want us to, I want us to um, consider the reasons behind why people insist on the, the use of what is called the sacred names, usually meaning the, the Hebrew names, and whether or not it makes any sense, whether or not there's any justification for it. As I said, a, a name is really primarily and firstly a means of identification. Sometimes when, you use, when we, we use a name, it's to identify characteristics. For example, you know, <clears throat> um, one of the names that people have today is the name Carter. And a, and, and a carter, the name carter might have come about in the past because there was somebody who, who used to make carts or the name um, John Potter. Somebody in the past might have been a potter, make, made pottery. Many of the, 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 the names, or maybe almost all of the names came into existence because of the jobs that people used to do. And so they have become attached to people today and they are no longer focusing on the job. They are focusing on just a sound that identifies you. Now, all of this we need to consider when we, when we, we think of the insistence that people make that you have to use the Hebrew names when you are referring to God. Now, of course, there are verses in the Bible that emphasize the, 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 the name of God. In Proverbs 18 and verse 10, I wanted to look at this verse. It says, <clears throat> The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. All right. So here you have a name emphasized. It says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. As a matter of fact, when you look at this verse, the word Lord is in, is in full capitals. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And, and those of us who are familiar with this, the, the way the Bible was put together, we know that whenever we see that capital, full capitals, Lord or God, the original word was YHWH, which is the way that the personal name of God was written in the Hebrew language. Now, the reason I put it that way is because up, up until today, there is strong debate among the scholars as to how that word was pronounced. There's strong debate. The, uh, uh, every now and then somebody comes along and he says he knows how to pronounce the word. But, but equally, somebody else comes along and says that pronunciation is wrong. And everybody has data and evidence to demonstrate why his way is right. Traditionally, in the English language, we have, we have said that the word is Jehovah. And of course, that is not accurate in, in, in terms of how the Hebrews <coughs> pronounce it, because in the Hebrew language, they did not even have the word J. 
and the word J is not actually among the letters. It's Y H W H. J is an English letter that came into usage a few hundred years ago. It didn't exist in the in the in the Hebrew language, and so you did not have any words in Hebrew that had the the, the sound J. But how how do you actually pronounce Y H W H? Because the fact is that the, the word is missing vowels. In fact, let me see if I can... Um, let me see if I can actually give us a screen and actually write that down because it might be helpful if I actually write it down. So, of course, also, of course I'm not talking about... Um, I'm not talking about Y H W H. Not like this, because of course, in in the in the Hebrew language, it was symbols. It wasn't these these English letters. But this is what it was the equivalent of. The Hebrew letters give us this equivalent in our Roman style lettering. So it's Y H W H. And what people have done is they have inserted certain letters. They have assumed, for some reason, that the missing letters are A, A, and E. I don't know, to be honest. I don't know if it's if it's A and E, but that is what they have assumed. They have assumed that the missing letters are A and E. And so you get Yahweh. You you have some interesting combinations that people have come up with. Like they say you should have an O in here. You should have a, you should have an O in here. The thing is that you can't pronounce the word. You can't pronounce Y H W H. It's unpronounceable because, as those of us who understand language, you're aware that you have to have vowels. The letters Y H W H are what we call consonants. They're hard, hard sounds, and you can't have words with only hard sounds. A part of the structure of language is that you have to have vowels, soft letters, soft sounds in between the hard sounds to give structure to the, 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 the language. So, they have had to put in vowels. It's obvious that vowels were missing. The Hebrews never wrote with vowels because, of course, the people knew the language. When they saw the, the consonants, they put in the vowels. But we are reading it hundreds of years later and so they are assuming that um, these are the vowels that should go there. Some people, for some reason, they conclude that this W should have been a V. And so they, they come up with different variations of the word. Yahweh, and, and recently I heard somebody say that it probably was it probably was Yehovah. So what I'm saying, the point I'm really making with all of this is that it is clear that there are many different ideas, many different interpretations as to how this word should really be pronounced. Now in spite of this, in spite of this, there is a great insistence on the part of these, these brethren who are in the sacred name movement. There's, a, there's an insistence that we have to use this word because it is, it is a personal name of God. And God is offended when we don't use the word, when we don't use his name. As it says here in Proverbs 18 and verse 10, the name of the Lord, the name of Yahweh, Yehovah, Jehovah, Yahuwah, however you pronounce it, as I said, everybody has a different version of it, and that is one of the major problems. Because if, if, if the name of if the if the sound of the name, if the pronunciation is so important, certainly there would have to be a way for it to be understood in a simple way that people could be very clear. It's like the doctrine of the Trinity, okay? 
there, there are many of us, myself included, who believe that the doctrine of the Trinity is a false teaching and that the whole world is in darkness and in apostasy because of the Trinity. But none of us has to be guessing and spelling. We can go to the Bible and we can see clearly striking strong evidence all through the Bible that the one God of the Bible is the Father and that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God and that the Bible does not teach a three-in-one God. That is very clear. But when it comes to how you pronounce the name of God, you can't find it in any version of the Bible. There's no version of the Bible in existence that tells you how to pronounce the name of God. The best you can find if you go to the Hebrew text, you'll find Y-H-W-H. That does not tell you how to pronounce it. You are still left wandering in the dark as to how to actually pronounce it. So to insist on the pronunciation, a particular pronunciation, from that very from that angle alone, respectfully I say it's nonsense. It's nonsense. God can't expect everybody to do something when there's no certainty as to what they are supposed to do. God is not foolish in that way. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I say in that way, that was a slip of the tongue. God is not foolish. God is not taking us for fools in that way, is what I meant to say. Whatever God intends that his people should do, the, the knowledge of it is very clear that the, the honest person does not need to be deceived. But even in this movement of seemingly very sincere people, there's so much confusion and so many different ways of pronouncing the word that it could never be an issue that is important. Just from that angle alone, there are many other angles we will come, come, come from. And um, you will find that that is just one of them. As we have seen, <laughs> in the perverted thinking of today, what I will call is modern idiocy. People emphasize the label and they lose the meaning. So what they have done is they have, they have, they have it's an illustration of how easily you can, you can misuse words, how easily words can be used to give wrong ideas. I'll give you one example. The, 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 the word gay, for example, it's a word for the rest of my life in this planet, I will never use the word gay to describe myself. Never. Many years ago, my father wrote a, a song. He was dabbling in writing, you know, Calypso type of songs. He was trying. My father was a poet and he did all kinds of things. And um, he, he, he was born and he grew up in Montego Bay. So he wrote a song about Montego Bay. It's kind, of, it's kind of ironic because even back in those days, Montego Bay was known as a, as a place where it had a reputation that you, know, you, you will encounter homosexuals in Montego Bay. The reason being that it was a tourist capital. It was a tourism capital. And in, in his song, but, but it's a popular, it was a popular place, it still is, in the song my father wrote, um, Gay, gay, Montego Bay. Gay, gay, Montego Bay. When my father wrote, wrote it, he, was, he, was, he meant to say, a place that w was full of laughter and happiness and gaiety, to use the word. It was full of happiness and, and, and carefreeness and so on. Today, he could never use this song. He could never use those words to refer to a place in Jamaica because nobody would ever sing it. It, it, would, it, would, it would cause offense to the people who live there. So, the point I'm making is that a word is simply a sound that conveys a meaning. And what it means is what comes to your mind when the word is used. That is what makes a word significant or a name significant. When you say somebody, tell somebody that he's a gay person today, very often you're liable, liable to get yourself into a fight. 
Because the word has taken on a certain meaning that most people don't want to be associated with. At least not in my part of the world, okay? So, modern society has taken to using labels and perverting the meaning of those labels. And I, I want to ask us to consider this even as we are thinking of the subject of this, the, the name of God because ultimately name, as I said, has two meanings. It can apply to the character of a person or it can apply to the sound that you make when you address the person. Now, it's very clear. Let me, let me look at another verse in Psalm 9 and verse 10. Look at what it says. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. Just the first part of the verse I want to look at. It says the people who know the name of the Lord. It says Lord here. So again, we're talking about Yahweh, Jehovah, Yahuwah, Yehovah, however you pronounce it. The people that know your name will put their trust in you. Now, let me ask you something. Can, can we say this is true of the name Yahweh or Jehovah or Yehovah? Can we say it is true that the people who know that name put their trust in him? I ask you to just consider for a moment and, and, and to be reasonable because there are, there are millions of people, maybe hundreds of millions of people who know the name. They know that this was the, the name that was used to refer to the God of the Bible during Old Testament times. And they have, they have no trust in God. They do not put their trust in God. They do not, they do not have any, any, any confidence, any faith in God. They are not Christians at all. But they know the name. And I can even point you to entire groups of people who actually use the name or know the name or refer to God by variations of the name who have no trust in God. So, so the, the, the verse here means nothing if you interpret name to mean the sound that is made. What is important when the Bible talks about thy name, what is important is the meaning behind the name or the character of the person. When the Bible says they that know thy name, what God is saying is that, the, or what the psalmist is saying is that the people who know your character will put their trust in you. This is simple and it is absolutely true. What makes me trust God? Is it because he's called Yahweh? Is it because he's called Jehovah? Is it because he's called God? Is it because he's called Yah Yahuwah or whatever? Is that what makes me trust God? No. That, that is simplistic reasoning. What makes me trust God is that I know his character. And the more I know his character, the more I love him. For me, one of the dearest titles of God is Father, to the point where I have now adjusted it in my personal prayer, and I'm now referring to him as Daddy. The only reason why I don't say Daddy publicly is because it kind of sounds a little, you know, it sounds a little weird to some people. I'm not, I, I, so in public I, I, I say Father, but sometimes Daddy slips out because I'm so, I, I'm so used to saying Daddy. And the reason is because the closest picture I have in my mind to somebody giving me unconditional love was my father. Amazing when I think about it. When I think about the kind of conflicts I had with my father at times, it's amazing for me to realize this. Now that he's dead and now that I understand God better, I realize that the, cl the closest person I had in my life who gave me unconditional love was my father. And so because of this, and, and for me, he was daddy. And so because of this, it's easy for me to fall into, into referring to God as daddy. And, and, and one of the things that I hold very dear to is, to is to be able to refer to him as my friend, my friend. Because I understand that a friend is somebody who chooses to be close to you. They don't have to be. They don't need to be. 
but they enjoy your company and so they choose your company. And those are, those are aspects of God's character that I have come to understand. And so for me, the, 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 the name friend and the name daddy, those are very dear to me. Many times I find myself talking to God and I'm using these words, my friend, my daddy. Sometimes I say my redeemer, my sovereign, my king, my God, my Lord. Each, each word that I use, is, each word that I use enhances the picture in my mind and helps me to, to, to feel him and see him more fully. That's what a name is supposed to do. Now, when, when the name Yahweh was given to the Hebrews, there's something interesting that, um, that God says. Let me see if I can find it quickly. God says, I can't find it, I'll be unhappy. Ah, I should have it at my fingertips, but it's not there. Um, God says, by my name, I was not known. I appeared to Abraham. Let me see if I can find that. How come I can't even find this? I appeared to Abraham, to Jacob, and to Isaac as the Lord God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah I was not known. If I don't find it this time, I'll just have to move on. But anyway, God says to... Ah, here it is. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. It's Exodus 6 and verse 3. Let me make a note of that verse. Look at what God says. Start from verse 2. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord, or, or, or I am Yahweh, or Jehovah, or Yahuwah, or ho, ho, however you pronounce it. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, which is really the Hebrew term El Shaddai. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob by the name El Shaddai. But by my name, Jehovah, which is Yahweh, Yahuwah, Yahuwah, Yehovah, I was not known to them. This is what God says to Moses. Yet I can show you, you can go back and you can find, you can find several places where God appears to God appears to Moses not to Moses God appears to Abraham by the name Jehovah and let me see if I can find an example I'm not going to find it so easily I'm going to have to mess up what I'm doing here to find it um but I want to show you where God actually appeared to Abraham by the name Jehovah. Let me see. So many of them. All right, here's Jacob. This is Jacob when he, when he, he had the vision at Bethel. It says, and Jacob vowed a vow, saying, if God be with me, he, he uses the word God, right? Elohim. If God will be with me and, and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall Yahweh, full capital letters, L, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, it's Y-H-W-H, then shall Yahweh or Yehovah or Jehovah or Yahuwah However, however you pronounce it, then shall the Lord be my God. He says, Yahweh, let's use Yahweh for example, Yahweh shall be my Elohim. That's what Jacob says. 
if I come again to this place in peace. He used the name Yahweh. He used the word Jehovah. And yet God said to Moses, they did not know me by my name. And I can show you where it's not just Jacob. Let me go back and find it with Abraham also. All right, that's not one of them. Here it says that the Lord was communing with Abraham, but it, it doesn't say that Abraham called him Lord. But it says the Lord was there, Yahweh was there. Right through this chapter it says that the Yahweh was speaking with Abraham, but it doesn't say Abraham called him Yahweh. So um, I don't want to look at what the Bible doesn't say. But let me see if we can. Here is another one. Well, this is where um, Hagar. Yeah. Here is Abraham's wife, Sarai. In Genesis 16 and verse 11. I'm not going to go, go any further than this verse because there are so many of them and I don't want to take the time and go searching. But it says, Sarah, I said unto Abraham, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. Yahweh judge between me and thee. The point I'm really trying to make here, which has taken a bit of our time, is that they clearly knew the word Yahweh. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they knew the word. And yet God says to Moses, I appeared to them as God Almighty, but they didn't know me by my name, Yahweh. It is clear that God is not referring to the sound. God is referring to the meaning behind the word. That's what God is talking about. So when God says they did not know me by the, the name Yahweh, God is, God is referring to the meaning behind the word Yahweh. Abraham knew the sound. Isaac knew the sound. The words, the word itself that people are insisting on. Abraham knew it. Isaac knew it. Jacob knew it. But they never knew the meaning of the word. God is interested in us understanding the meaning of the word, not in us being able to pronounce the sound. Because that helps nobody. To, to know the sound helps nobody. Now, all of us understand that in the Old Testament times, Israel was in the context of a culture where there were many different gods. There, there, there were the, the gods of Canaan, and I could, I, I could off the tip of my tongue list a, a number of them. There was Chemosh, there was Adramelech, there was Ashtoreth, there was Baal, there was, there was, there was Marduk, there was Dagon, many of them. And um, it's in this context where people believed and worshipped other gods that it became necessary to have a name for the God of, of, of Israel. Because if you said God in the context of Canaan, there were, there were dozens of different gods. And a part of God's plan for establishing a people unto himself was to make it clear and distinctive that the God they worshipped was identified differently from the other gods around. Notice that God set out to make this distinction by, by manifesting great power. He showed that the God of Israel was more powerful. And so when they heard the name Yahweh, the heathen recognized that the God that was referred to by this name was more powerful than any other God. It was not a question of identifying that there was only one God in the universe. No, that was not the issue. The issue was identifying that the God belonging to a particular people was superior to the other gods. That is why it was important that they also know the name as well as the character. Because the name was the way of identifying him as different from the surrounding gods. So, we have to consider the context in which they live. Because in the Old Testament, 
the word Yahweh, Jehovah, however they pronounced it, was important. But over and over you see where God is saying that what they need to understand is the meaning behind the name. Now what I want to point out is that when you come to the New Testament, there is no such emphasis. Nobody can find anywhere in the New Testament where there is any emphasis on the name of God in terms of how you pronounce it. There is interest in the New Testament in the name of God. There is interest, but never in the word that is used. You have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You have the 14 epistles of the Apostle Paul. You have those of Peter and James and Jude and John. None of them ever emphasizes a particular word identified as the name, the personal name of God. As a matter of fact, there, there is no existing manuscript of the Bible that was written in Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, where, where the personal name that was used in the Old Testament appears at all. There is a Bible that has been put together. It is, it is called the Scriptures, where you have the word Jehovah or Yahweh, I think it is, in the New Testament, many places. This is a fabrication. It's somebody's invention. Somebody went and put in the words where they think the word should be. It's not in any original manuscript. Now, if, if, the, if, the, if the word itself was so important, how could God have allowed it to be so completely lost as to make this issue so wrapped up in mystery, if it is so important? The point is that when you look at the New Testament, nobody emphasizes the sound. There are places in the New, in the New Testament where the name of God is emphasized, but never in terms of the sound that is used, always in terms of the character. John 17 and verse 6, Jesus says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Jesus says, I have manifested or I have revealed your name. Where did he ever manifest the name Yahweh, Jehovah, Jehovah, or whatever. Where did he ever do that? Where can anybody find anybody find one single verse in the entire in the four gospels where Jesus says, This is the way the Father's name is pronounced. Or the Father's name is even, even the statement itself, if you could say they, they mistranslated the word. But where does he ever say the Father's name is such and such? No. Every time he spoke of the Father, he says, My Father. And he says, when you pray, you say, Our Father who art in heaven. He's manifesting a certain name to the people, and the name is the name Father. He's asking us to think of God in a certain character. He's asking us to think of certain characteristics. And when it's over, he says, I have revealed your name. What did he reveal? He revealed God's character. That is the name of God that is important. That is the name of God that teachings like the Trinity and eternal burning hell. And some of these other doctrines have, have perverted, they have distorted the name of God. They have given God a bad name and a bad face. This is the name that needs to be emphasized, not the sound, because anybody can make a sound. It takes a child of God. It takes somebody who admires and loves the true God, to manifest his character, to manifest his name. Over and over and over, you find that this is the emphasis of the New Testament. I have manifested your name. When you go to Revelation chapter 14, another place where the name of God is emphasized, it says, and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their forage. If we are simplistic, no, I, 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 as a matter of fact, I don't think anybody could be this simplistic as to believe that the, 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 the word YHWH is actually written in people's forage, as though that is the issue. You know that that is a nonsensical interpretation. What it means is that the 144,000 have the Father's character 
in their foreheads. This is what the New Testament emphasizes. They have the character of the Father in their foreheads. And, this is, and this, this is referred to as the name of God. This is what is emphasized in the New Testament. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse, um, verse 12. Jesus says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Three names. The name of God, the name of the new Jerusalem, the name of Jesus. Anybody thinks that this is literally written in the name of people, in the heads of people. Literally written somewhere on your body. Man, you might as well be a pagan. You are superstitious. You, you, you lack understanding when it comes to the word of God. It's the character that is being emphasized. And this is true Right throughout the New Testament. The New Testament is where we move from legalism. We move from the external to the internal, from the superficial to what really matters. The Old Testament, as we know, was focused on physical, material, visible, audible things of the flesh. The New Testament is focused on things of the spirit, spiritual meaning, inward realities, not the outward form. And that is why the New Testament never emphasizes the necessity of focusing on the word that you use, the sound that you use. Now, of course, the word Yahweh in, in, the, in the Hebrew language, it had a particular meaning. It had the meaning of the self-existent one. When when the Lord appeared to Moses. And um, it's probably chapter 3. I'm looking at chapter 4. The end of chapter 3, yes. And um, when, Moses, when Moses asks God, whom shall I say? Moses said unto God, Exodus 3, verses 13 and 14, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name, and what shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. As you know, I'm not a student of Hebrew, but I'm, I'm, I'm repeating some of what I've read. I understand that the word Yahweh is the word from which you get this phrase, I am. That's the, that's the underlying meaning of the word Yahweh. It means the self-existent one. So I am the one who is, the one who exists in himself. So Yahweh means the self-existent one. And so when God says, tell them that Yahweh has sent me. God was saying, tell them that the person you met is the one who is the self-existent God. Of course, they had a word that carried that meaning, and the word is Yahweh. And that's the word they used. There, is, there are very few people today who know that the word Yahweh means self-existent one. M most people, and maybe many who are actually promoting the use of the word, don't even have a clue what the word actually means. They are focusing on the superficial. If I wanted to talk about the God of heaven today, I would say the self-existent, eternal God. And I'd be saying the same as what God meant when he said, tell them that Yahweh has sent you. It means the same thing. It's the meaning that is important and not the sound. And that is why a person who cannot speak can address God and can speak can address God because he doesn't have to say a word for God to hear. And a person who cannot hear can address God because he doesn't have to pronounce things the exact way for God to respect what he says. It's the meaning that is implied in the name of God. And um, just one final thing I want to say because my time is up. When you look at um, 
the book of Revelation, for example. I was going to, there's a long list I have here, but there are so many places in Revelation where you see that God, the God of heaven is referred to. And when you look at Revelation, he's referred to as the Lord God Almighty, Revelation 4 and verse 8. Revelation 4 and verse 11. O Lord, Revelation 7 and verse 10. Our God which sitteth upon the throne. Revelation 7 and verse 15. They are before the throne of God. Revelation 7 and verse 17. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There are many of these verses in Revelation. None of these verses refer to Yahweh or Jehovah or Yehovah. Yehovah. They all say the Lord or the Lord God or the Lord God Almighty. They all refer to the, the person in heaven as God. Somebody may say they must have changed it. They must have written from Hebrew to Greek and put in the Greek word. I, I, I really hope that we don't have to go to that place to distort the word of God and to throw questions upon what God has given us. This is the way the Bible has come to us. 2,000 years, there's no hint or clue that it was ever written any other way. The book of Revelation is the book that takes us, gives us a glimpse of heaven and the way they worship in heaven. And consistently throughout the book, the sovereign of the universe, the king who sits on the throne in heaven, is referred to as the Lord God. So, I don't think that for God it really is a big issue that we should actually use the Hebrew phraseology in referring to him. These things ultimately are distractions. They turn us away from the real important things, which is the character of God, as I've been saying. This is what is important, that men may know the character of God, to know the name of God, which is his character. That's what we should focus on. That's what we should manifest in our lives and in our words, because when we manifest and reveal the, word, the, 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 the character of God, that is what draws people to God. To draw them to anything else is to bring them into fanaticism and to lead them to focus on what is superficial. This is by no means a comprehensive examination of this subject, but I hope that at least I've said enough to cause us to look at it from what I consider to be the right perspective.